sometimes we're finding that it's easier for us to predict things about you by looking at your friend's data and your friend's friend's data than it is your own data. And the reason why is because even though their data is lower quality, it's much higher quantity. You know, you'll, you'll scale up to hundreds of friends, that means you're scaling up to tens of thousands of friends of friends. You have all that information that's gonna guide you to figure out what kind of person you are. Can, can I influence what my friends do by, if I say I'm gonna take a diet, I'm going on a diet, I wanna lose weight. Does that radiate out into my friend's community, let's say on Twitter? If I tweet, I'm, you know, I'm going on some sort of diet today. Yes, and so we've seen correlation between you and your friends and your friend's friends and even your friend's friend's friends in these networks. And there have been experimental studies that show that when you make a change, that it actually affects the people that you're directly connected to. So at least some of the reason why you and your friend's friend's friends are the same is because of this influence that's propagating through the network. Hmm. Uh, can you influence who they're going to vote for by saying, I'm going to vote for this person? Yes. Um, now, we have not studied that explicitly, but we did do a 60 million person experiment on Facebook in the 2010 election. How many of you might have logged in on election day in 2010 on Facebook? Raise your hand. So you were members of this experiment. Um, and we showed some, <laughs> that's right, thank you very much. Um, we showed did, some did people. They, did you know you were members of that experiment? <laughs> we can talk about ethics later if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> So, um, so we showed some people a message and didn't show other people the message, and it was random. So there was nothing about you that was correlated with whether or not you got the message. And the people who saw the message voted more in real life, because we matched it to publicly available voter registration records, and their friends voted more. But what if, what if I don't have any Facebook friends? You know, I'm one of those few people who didn't do anything. Am I left out of this? Am I, can, uh, is the data bad because you're only taking people who tweet or have Facebook friends? So first of all, more than 60% of Americans who are adults are active on Facebook. So this has really penetrated um, people at all ages. And if anything, usage is somewhat higher in older people now because um, teenagers have figured out that, that all their moms and dads are there. So they don't use it as much. When they go to college, they, they tend to get back onto it. But, but there's a lot of people there. And we know that Facebook users are a little bit different in some ways. They tend to be a little bit more extroverted, maybe a little more concerned about privacy. But by and large, they tend to look a lot like the population as a whole. I actually have this talk that I give um, about, it's called Back to the Village. Um, one of the things that people pointed out in the early days of Facebook was, oh, it's so embarrassing now because I post my pictures on Facebook and, oh, I got a little, uh, little drunk last Friday night. And before, nobody knew about that because I live in the city and there's a lot of anonymity. But if you think about early village life, life in the ancestral environment, if you made a fool out of yourself one evening, everybody knows about it. <laughs> so our desire for privacy... But they didn't know about it on the other side of the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we probably don't care about those people. We care about our village. Um, and the idea of privacy is itself, I think, an anomaly in human history. It's, it's a, a product of living in cities, which we've only been doing for about 100 years. We're just now getting to the point where a majority of people live in cities. Um, and so I'm, I kind of think what's happening is social media is taking us back to a time where we lived in these communities where there was a lot of awareness about all the things that everyone that we're connected to are doing. Can you tell by observing big data and people's habits and things like that how the stock market's going to go? That well, it, it, in fact, there's a study that we've been working on that's looking at Twitter data, and we're not trying to forecast the stock market for uh, uh, profit uh, purposes, but of we're looking not. at, uh, we're, but, we are, but we are looking at things like volatility. And it turns out that when you get a certain uh, increase in tweets about a particular stock, take a ticker symbol, for example, uh, when you get a certain number of tweets uh, and it goes up over time, you can actually show that the stock market volatility increases for that particular stock. So imagine if you can monitor all of this traffic on a real-time basis, you can actually get a sense of how the market is moving, when we're about to uh, get into a, a potential crash, and uh, ultimately be able to do something about that. Mm -hmm.